or tough and bold decisions. Would you as president privatize the NNPC? Oh my goodness, I think that by virtue of my public position on the necessity for total deregulation of the petroleum and the gas sector and the natural resources sector of our country, it, is very, it should be very clear that I would put NNPC in a place where it faces the discipline of the market. As president, I wouldn't want to be president of NNPC, no. I would have too many important issues that especially affect the ones living on the margins of our society. My, you know, the focus every day is going to be how to bring as many people who are at the bottom of the pyramid into um, stake, into having a stake in Nigeria. So I wouldn't have time to be sitting with uh, the NMPC director to give him permission to give oil block to somebody. The market discipline is going to be what NNPC faces. So um, I would absolutely, comprehensively, with joy, deregulate that sector because I know that that would do greater good to the poor and it would be the most sensible, evidence-based thing to do. The poor are getting the wrong end of the stick because of the distortions in our petroleum sector. It is time for the poor to stop paying so that the rich can enjoy the level of recklessness that we see in, uh, in abuse of, uh, of, 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 the, um, of the kind of um, opportunities that the sector gives to them. A line that um, you've used a lot, not just today, but you've used it a lot of times, is you, you, you believe that we should have a productive and competitive yes. economy and citizens. So, speaking about that, we would like to know what your um, presidency is going to mean for the economy and for job creation. Uh, and, and, and I need to link it with inclusive growth because I know, you know, for a very long time we had growth in the country, but there are many who would argue that, you know, it wasn't an inclusive growth and then the inequality um, widened, uh, widened somewhat. So, what are your actual plans for the economy and then for job creation? So this is an economy where still we have a huge percentage of those who operate within it being in the informal low productivity sectors. So they are doing a lot of, if you looked at the structure of the Nigerian economy, you would see that um, uh, you know, oil has shrunk in terms of what percentage of the GDP it represents. It's about 15%, maybe 13% thereabout. Uh, you have um, um, sectors like the creative sector and technology now adding to GDP at less than uh, 6%. Um, you have um, the um, manufacturing sector at less than 20%. Um, now, the rest of the sector is made up of services. But when you look at the services, it's of services and trade and all of that, you find that it is low productivity services mostly. And the reason it is so is because agriculture also um, is, uh, is significant, but it is uh, not as, as huge as it used to be. It's in the region of about 2025 or, or thereabout. Now, the thing about this sector, uh, the, this sectoral divide uh, of, uh, the, of the economy is that if you, if you looked at where most of the people are, it is in those low productivity areas. So you've got to look at the barriers to their productivity. And so removing the barriers to their productivity, when you talk about the critical infrastructure, you talk about the kind of training, the, uh, you talk about the access to capital, to finance, uh, you talk about their connection, connectivity to the markets. And you look at the whole enabling environment for, for really doing business without too much of, um, uh, uh, too much of hassles, of regulation, of all kinds of uh, you know, uh, taxation that, that is wrong-headed. 
you know. So when you look at the multiplicity of the barriers uh, to productivity, and you t used policies or targeted investments, public investments, or you, you use institutional reforms to change those barriers, to remove those barriers, and instead provide incentive for people who are in informality, because low productivity activities are mostly informal sector. And so if you give them an incentive to move from informality to formality, then you can target your support to them. And the support that you provide to them would begin to enhance their productivity, their competitiveness. And uh, so that's key for me. Um, the other thing that's key for me is what I already said, which is we would identify all sources of economic growth. Today's economic growth that we have is less than at, um, you know, we, we, we went from an average of 6% uh, over almost a decade and a half uh, to recession and coming out of recession, we were some str somewhere between 1.8% to 2.2%, you know, by estimate. Um, that is not good enough because every year we are growing in our population by over 3%. At, 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 at best, maybe 2.8 percent sometimes. But that's if you see our growth lower than our economic growth lower than our population growth, we're not growing. We're not growing uh, economically. So what it means is that we must uh, not just interrogate the quality, which is where you were, what you were saying, the quality and the structure of our growth, but we have to look at finding more sources of growth so that our growth will be higher. We need to sustain growth at above 7% annually. We need to shoot for the, for the, for the moon. Um, and as much as possible, say to ourselves, what, what were the kinds of things that enabled double-digit growth to happen in some of the other economies? How do we achieve those? Um, maximum um, investment both by private sector and public sector is going to be key. But investment uh, that is not based on solid policies would just be like uh, uh, the way that you invest into generating power and you can't evacuate power. So it's got to be very scientific, the approach that we take for getting the economy. Now, all of this is, of course, tied to that big jobs, jobs, and more jobs agenda. <laughs> You're not making people more productive and competitive for nothing. The idea is that we have three to four million young people entering the unemployment, uh, entering the labor market every year. Now you have three to four million young people. My goodness, that's huge. That's really huge. So you have to find all the opportunities for uh, ensuring that the employability and therefore the readiness to be deployed to gainful work is taken care of. So our whole program on education and skills development, as I highlighted it, and ensuring that curricula at every level is linked to the labor market is crucial for that. And then our reforms, our economic reforms, <laughs> ensuring that we have macroeconomic stability, that uh, uh, the stability of our fiscal and monetary uh, environment gives confidence. Confidence to investors, confidence to consumers, confidence to uh, the, uh, the, the market uh, more generally, including you know, government confidence too. Uh, so that at, at, by getting that, by getting a macroeconomically stable environment. We are running, it means that we are running stability of prices at a certain level, whether the prices have to do with foreign exchange or has to do with interest rate. And then we're looking at inflation and ensuring that inflation is not wiping out the real value for especially the poorer segment of our society as well as for business 